Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Division of Rheumatology Grand Rounds. Um, I just wanted to note a couple of things before I pass off to Dr. Alcon. Um, Dr. Wei is going to save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of his lecture to answer any questions that you have. Uh, for questions, please type them into the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, there is a chat box as well, but please try to keep all of your questions to the Q&A box so they're concentrated into one area. Okay, and now I'm going to pass things off to our division head, Dr. Keith Elkhorn. Thank you. Okay, good morning. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Kevin Way. Kevin is an instructor at the Brigham in Boston. He got his MD and PhD at Stanford, moved to Harvard for internship, residency, and fellowship. And since 2014, Kevin has been working at the Brigham in the orbit of Michael Brenner. Uh, he, he, the focus of his research is on inflammation and rheumatoid arthritis with a particular emphasis on stromal cells. And he contributed to studies showing functionally relevant fibroblast heterogeneity in the joints of RA patients. And most recently in a very uh, nice incisive paper published in Nature, he showed the dynamic regulation of gene transcription in synovial fibroblasts using single cell technology. So welcome, Kevin. Um, it's pretty you can't be here, although you tell me that you're not having such severe heat and humidity in Boston, uh, but I'm sure you wouldn't mind our weather here, having recently been here. Anyway, it's good to have you on Zoom anyhow, and uh, we look forward to your, your lecture. Great. Thank you, Keith, with the nice introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be to, to visit virtually. Um, I look forward to meeting some of you later. And please, you know, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the question and answer box. I'll do my best to answer them at the end of the talk. Okay. And these are my disclosures. So I want to start the talk by taking just a couple minutes to uh, kind of give you a context why we think that targeting fibroblasts in RA is a good idea, right? So as rheumatologists, you know, I'm sure that, you know, we'll see patients, you know, clinic that, you know, we treat with various, you know, biologic medications or EMRs that, you know, most of them do well, but, you know, there is a proportion of patients who, uh, despite all the different drugs we try, that do not achieve sustained remission, right? So there's clearly uh, still a med need to find a better way to treat the patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the second idea here is really that the idea is that, um, when we treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis with immunosuppressive medications, the risk of infection is a serious issue, right? We always consider, you know, kind of think about weighing the, the balance between not wanting to uh, overexpose them to immunosuppressive medications, but still want to control their uh, rheumatoid arthritis, right? So one of the ideas behind trying to target the joint tissue, especially the stroma side of the joint tissue, is the idea that we can perhaps bypass this side effect of systemic immunosuppression thereby allows to treat RA without truly immunocompromising our patients. So uh, what are fibroblasts, right? This is a cell type that we and others have focused on over the last several decades. And this is a diagram from a recent review from uh, Gary Fryasing's group, in which he nicely summarizes some of the advances, especially uh, on, towards the understanding of fibroblast pathology in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, on the left here, as you can see, is the illustration of a normal synovium. For the fibroblast uh, here, colored in um, yellow, is really the main cell type that forms the lining of the synovium. And its main function is really to maintain a kind of homeostasis for the uh, uh, joint tissue through its production of collagen as well as other extracellular proteins. And probably one of the key function of fibroblasts in a healthy knee is to secrete uh, lupercin and other proteoglycans into the joint fluid so that I can maintain kind of lubrication function for the, uh, uh, for the joint. In contrast, if you look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis here, depending on the right, the fibroblast takes on a very different function. And we think many of these properties of fibroblasts contribute to RA pathology. One, fibroblasts secrete a number of chemokines that's responsible for recruiting leukocytes from the blood vessels into the joint tissue. They also support the growth of blood vessels through the secretion of proangiogenic factors that uh, help maintain this vascularized uh, penis. And through the work of Erica Noss and others, uh, we know that fibroblasts are the dominant source of IL-6, which is an important cytokine in the pathogenesis of RA. 
So, you know, our lab, including others, have really tried to think about ways to therapeutically, therapeutically target these cells with treatment RA. But yet, with decades of research, you know, uh, there's yet to be a FDA-approved um, drug that directly targeted fibroblasts. And why is that? You know, I think, you know, there are many answers to that question. Um, I'll offer two thoughts. Um, and one is that, you know, the system we use to characterize or study these cells, you know, have predominantly relied on cultured fibroblasts. So we take a joint tissue and dissociate them, and these fibroblasts stick to the bottom of a plastic um, uh, well, and they kind of expand to a cell line. And most of us know that when you grow cells in a dish, um, they don't fully recapitulate the native environment, right? So we lose a lot of the uh, pathological signature that associate with them in the native joint. So that's the first barrier. Um, I think the second barrier is really a very interesting concept and something that we'll dive into later in this talk, is the idea that fibroblasts are actually heterogeneous. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the traditional dogma is really that, you know, fibroblasts is one cell type, you know, that you find it in the joint, you find it in the skin, they're just, you know, kind of, um, you know, connected tissue uh, related cell. But over the past five to 10 years or so, you know, emerging evidence from both, you know, um, uh, arthritis, you know, uh, research, as well as cancer research, have really shown us that fibroblasts exist as heterogeneous cell subtypes. So the analogy one would make is, you know, think about T cells, where now we know there are so many different T effector, uh, uh, T helper cells with different effective functions. I think the paradigm now is shifting for fibroblasts, where maybe a similar analogy would be drawn, where there are different subsets of fibroblasts with distinct functions. And so that's the, the concept we'll try to um, uh, convince you of the next uh, few minutes. So our, pr our overall approach to addressing these two barriers, right, of translating a basic discovery into a therapy, is really this, right? We want to start with patient-derived joint tissue as a source material. And this is not something that, you know, people haven't thought about before, um, but what makes our approach unique is the ability to leverage some of the novel uh, single cell profiling techniques to be able to examine fibroblasts in a single cell level. So the overall approach is summarized here, but what are the actual techniques? So this is a, a diagram I borrowed from a, a review from uh, uh, York Ehrman, a colleague of mine, which he knows, in which he's nicely summarized some of the advances in immune profiling techniques over the past you know, 10, 15 years. You know, starting from all the way back in the 1960s, right? You may consider flow cytometry as really the first single cell immunoprofiling technique where you can discern cell type based on expression of surface markers. And the whole field of cytometry has advanced rapidly over the last you know, uh, several decades to now we're able to uh, visually uh, um, uh, see different cell subsets through mass cytometry, which is similar to flow cytometry, except that instead of conjugating the antibody to a fluorophore, uh, the antibody is conjugated to a specific heavy metal which through measurement of time of flight, you can now discern difference in surface expression. In parallel, I think the technology that's really changed this field is really the um, invention of single cell sequencing. So the idea here is that instead of measuring gene expression at the bulk or whole tissue level, we can now measure gene expression at a single cell level. So this you know, technology not only allows us to see all the different cell subsets in the purple blood, Right? But when you apply to a tissue such as synovium, we're now able to really see the different cell types and cell states right? that can uh, that these cells can exist in uh, pathology. So these are the two techniques that I think I will uh, focus our talk on regarding how these uh, applying these high dimension analyses has really kind of uh, changed the way we think about fibroblasts in RA. But first, let's go through some of the more uh, kind of um, uh, low dimension analysis, such as phosphatometry. So our interest in defining fibroblast heterogeneity really started, you know, as a kind of a simple way to approach, right? Meaning that, could you identify markers that can tell us different subtypes of fibroblasts in a joint? So shown on the left here is, is a immunofluorescent staining uh, where we take a piece of RA synovium and stain them with just three markers, polyplanin in blue, thi one or CD90 in red, and CD31 is a um, vascular endothelium marker. And what we can appreciate here is that the lining uh, are consists of fibroblasts that most express poloplanin and do not express CD90. Now, if you go deeper into the sublining or kind of the interstitial space, now you see a difference in the expression of these two markers, right? Now we can begin to appreciate these uh, sublining fibroblasts here marked by the expression CD90 in red. 
And notice how the B cells are really located around blood vessels, right here and here. And this is a concept that we'll actually come back to in terms of the relevance to blood vessels. And what we did initially was really just use these markers that we know can discern purple fibroblasts from uh, using histology, and then apply full cytometry to dis disaggregate the cellular tissue. And what we've shown here is a representative flow plot of fibroblast, where we get on CD45 negative and CD31 negative cells. We can now subset them based on these few markers, CD34, proplanin, and thiamine. one And what we realize is that you can really see a distinction between this population of fibroblasts, which are thiamine one and proplanin positive, and this population, which is thiamine one negative and proplanin positive, representing, we think, lining and subunding fibroblast. We then went on to use, ask, if you use full cytometry, can you see a difference in terms of the proportion of fibroblasts in patient with OA versus RA? Indeed, you can. This is the quantification of the overall composition of fibroblasts in patient uh, 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 with OA versus RA. And what you can appreciate here is that the dominant cell population, at least in the stromal cell population in OA, are really these lining fibroblasts. About half of them are lining fibroblasts. In contrast, RA is really characterized by this uh, enrichment of subunding fibroblasts. Here in this cohort, making about 22% of all the stromal cells in the synovium. And we went next on, went on to ask, is this really just a marker uh, or does it actually correlate with inflammation? So here using a cohort of patients where we're able to obtain um, joint biopsy uh, samples, we tried to quantify the proportion of subunding fibroblasts against measurements of inflammation. Here on the left, using CD45 positive as a rough measurements of immune cell infiltration. In the middle is using the histological measurements of inflammation, uh, the current inflammation score. And finally, using a clinical measurement of joint inflammation, uh, which is the ultrasound um, uh, uh, score hypertrophy, to really get a sense of whether or not fibroblasts can track with inflammation. And what we saw is that indeed, not only does uh, subunding fibroblasts you know, are expanding RA, the abundance of these fibroblasts actually play with all three independent measurements of inflammation. So this is very exciting to us because um, even as a correlation study, we suggest that we can identify a particular marker that tracks with the fibroblast population uh, in, with inflammation. And it's really around this time that we were fortunate to be part of the AMP um, RA consortium and AMP consortium is really meant to, uh, the focus of this consortium is to apply high dimension analysis to uh, inflamed tissues, focusing on RA and lupus as the two uh, disease uh, uh, cohorts. And what we did uh, over the last five, six years is to develop a pipeline where we can collect uh, biopsies from patients with rheumatoid arthritis and process them into parallel high dimension analyses that includes cytometry histology, as well as RNA sequencing. And this is a work that really came out of the uh, consortium over the last five years. We were you know, uh, fortunate to be part of the consortium to carry out the pipeline analysis. Um, so uh, before we go into data, I just wanna show you kind of some of the insight we learned from being a part of this consortium. The first question is, is how do you analyze the data generated from this kind of a, a tissue pipeline? And the first observation is really that RA tissue are a little bit different. And what we mean by that, when we first went to this analysis, we thought we can just compare OA with RA. But it turns out that when you look at the joint tissue of RA patient, there are at least two major categories we can uh, um, kind of suck that into. The first category, what we call leukorich, rich is the kind of classical you know, inflammatory synovium we see where um, the synovium is dominated by infiltration of leukocytes. Um, here showing by histology, but you can also appreciate here, shown by mass cytometry, the major cell type we see in these core patients are lymphocytes, both CD4, CD8 T cells, plasma cell B cells, as well as different population macrophages. In contrast, we find that there is a core patient uh, that exhibit a lack of inflammation. So we define that as local pore. Here, most of these patients is a bit very, you know, few in inflammatory cell infiltration and the major cell population are dominated by stromal cells, including in the real stomach fibroblasts. In some way, they actually resemble the OA uh, because, you know, for the lack of the immune cell infiltration. And this was a useful um, uh, insight because now it allows us to now to make the meaningful comparison 
to analyze what's different in the fiberglass from local rich RA compared to the local poor RA. So when you first look at the RNA sequencing, we're very encouraged to find that if you compare the genes that are highly upregulated in fibroblasts from RA to local rich RA, you can see all these chemokines and cytokines that we know, right, from literature that are important in RA pathogenesis. Here, pointing out a few IL-6, clearly is upregulated in the local rich cohort, as well as many of the chemokines that we think are important in recruiting leukocytes into the joint. If we were to apply the uh, uh, gene set enrichment analysis, we can see that this uh, set of genes is telling us that these fibroblasts are responding to interferon signaling and turn on turning off their inflammatory response um, to the stimulation. But I just told you that fibroblasts consist, cons consist of heterogeneous subtypes. So we ought to be able to discern a particular cell subset that carry this pathogenic inflammatory fibroblast signature. So we next turn into mass cytometry, and here is using 11, uh, sorry, 10 fibroblast markers that were known that are expressed in fibroblasts, including TAHIR 11, polyplan CD90, and basically ask how many different subsets of fibroblasts can we identify using these 10 markers. It turns out that if you look at the differential expression of the surface expression pattern, we can actually nominate as many as eight fibroblast subsets, here depicted in different colors on this TC plot. And now I'd draw attention to these two clusters here uh, in uh, uh, pink and also in yellow. These populations of fibroblasts are characterized by expression CD90 and HLADR, all right, so class two. If you add these two populations together, they make up only about maybe 4% of the total fibroblast population in OA. However, if you look at RA, especially inflamed, inflamed RA cohort, you can see that they make up about half, 50% of all the stromal cells in a synovium. And that translates to about 17-fold uh, expansion in RA. So clearly this suggests to us that maybe this, this is the population, right, that's expanding RA. But the question is, do, are these the pathogenic fibroblasts that carry that inflammatory signature? So we next turn into single cell RNA sequencing. Um, so uh, the data generated in the phase one, the AMP consortium, we focus on the full matrix subtype fibroblast the myeloid and derived monocytes and microphages, T cells and B cells. And through single cell RNA sequence analysis, we're able to nominate uh, distinct cell states that's characterized by differential gene expression at a single cell level. So here are the major clusters of fibroblast and immune cells that were uh, nominated based on this differential gene expression analysis. Um, the full set of data can be uh, visualized here on this uh, our um, uh, uh, AMP analysis website. Uh, and it also describes the method that we can generate the data. But for today's talk, I will focus on the fibroblast. We zoomed in on this one particular population uh, that carries the expression CD90, which we know is expanding RA, but also uh, expression high level of class two HLA. And what's interesting, if you look at the, what's unique about this population, uh, colored in dark blue, it's really that this is the population that expresses high level of IL-6, as well as the interferon signature, right, that we saw in the bulk RNC data. So this suggests to us that not only is CD90 and HLA a marker fibroblast, these are the, what we think are the pathogenic fibroblasts, right, that's important in mediating inflammatory response in RA. Um, so around this time, um, our colleague in, um, in UK published a very exciting report, um, and this is the, my colleague, Adam Croft, who led the study in, in Dr. Christopher uh, Buckley's lab, using a mouse model of arthritis, where the serum from a uh, threaded mouse is transferred to a sibling mouse, to a sibling mouse and develop a very severe and acute inflammatory arthritis over the course of two weeks. What they did was that they took fibroblast from these mice, and doubly transfer into this recipient mice and ask the question, does a doubly transfer of these thyroid and positive fibroblasts worsen arthritis? And it turns out they actually did. So here is one of the figures from their paper, which they um, adopted transfer thyroid and fibroblasts into the joint of these recipient mice in red. And what they saw is that the mice that received the transfer of these thyroid and fibroblasts actually have prolonged inflammation 
as measured by the paw thickness of these mice compared to the chain control. So to us, you know, this was a very exciting study that in some way is a parallel to our analysis of human uh, data that truly suggests for the first time, not only fibroblast function could be transferred just like a immune cell, uh, but also that this particular subset characterized by expression of thia one is actually you know, pathogenic, right? So this led us to our next phase of study, which is asking the question, what, what are these fibroblasts? Where do they come from? In particular, what is this marker thi one so this set of studies, we, we thought we needed more, um, a better uh, um, look at all the stromal cells in the RA synovia. So what we did was to take a joint tissue from RA and OA patient and we reached for the stromal cell. Here, based on a very simple sorting scheme to enrich for uh, stromal cells uh, by collecting CD45 negative synovial cells. And we performed droplet-based single cell RNA sequencing, which is, is uh, a way to generate kind of a massive data sets looking at um, um, thousands of cells from each donor. Um, so using this approach, we are able to survey about 35,000 uh, stromal cells uh, from six RA and six OA donor. And this um, plot is a UMAP projection of all the cells from these 12 donors and kind of uh, integrated together. So now for the first time, we're gonna see the different uh, components of the synovian stroma we see the vascular endothelial cells. We see the mural cells, which consists of the pericytes, as well as the vascular muscle cells, the cells that line the blood vessel walls, as well as our favorite fibroblast populations. Here, uh, the thyroid positive fibroblasts are colored in this kind of a, a green color, and the lining fibroblasts, based on the expression of PRG4, colored in orange. But one thing that struck us by this analysis, actually, it kind of unexpected, is really that instead of forming two discrete clusters of fibroblasts, when you analyze thousands of these cells, you actually see this kind of a um, continuum where you do have this separation of these two cell states, but there's also this existence of this kind of intermediate state where they're kind of, you know, neither lining or self lining. And this to us suggests maybe these cells, this, um, instead of being, you know, very distinct cell types are actually related to each other, right? So to test this hypothesis, we first perform a um, trajectory analysis. So the trajectory analysis essentially is a way to ask how similar are the difference on the cell types, right, in analysis. So what we did, we took fibroblasts from the data set and essentially put them on this one dimensional trajectory and asked, do they form any kind of meaningful, you know, uh, continuum? The answer is yes, right? So what we saw here is that on two ends of the spectrum, you have sublining fibroblasts and lining fibroblasts. But you look at the middle here, there's this all of this uh, uh, continuum of cells, right, that are neither lining or sublining, rather they form this kind of smooth uh, continuum. And we then looked at what gene expression track with this gradient. And we were able to identify a whole number of genes whose expression um, goes where are low in the sublining, but slowly increases as you go towards the lining. At the same time, we identify another set of genes whose expression is highest in the sublining and gradually decreases as you move towards the lining, right? So this type of analysis at least suggests to us that perhaps uh, fibroblasts exist in the continuum and the difference in the phenotype may represent a actual difference in differentiation. So first to find out whether or not, you know, this continuum is actually uh, real, we went back into the tissue of um, uh, RA synovium and performed immun immunofluorescent staining. In this particular image, we stained for lubricin, which we thought was a lining marker, and CD90 in green as a sublining marker. But what we saw again is this gradient where the cell in the periphery, in the lining, are truly PRG positive. But as you go for, go into the subline, you see this change in gradation of the ratio of PRG plus CD90. And what's intriguing to us is actually the um, area where there's really high CD90 expression, it's really around these blood vessels, which is here called up by expression of BWF or bound one gram factor. And we actually quantified this ratio of CD90 to PRG4 from these uh, images as a function of a fibroblast position next to endothelium. 
So what this plot is showing is the ratio of CD90, or PRG4, for each cell identified in the image, shown on the left, as, it, uh, as you move away from the nearest blood vessel, right? And we can see here that there really is a smooth transition from high CD90 to low CD90 as you go away from the blood vessel, right? And this suggests to us that perhaps this differentiation program is essentially really about their position, right? So the term we use to describe this is positional identity, that we hypothesize that perhaps a fibroblast is really dictated by their relative position in synovium. If you're closer to a blood vessel, then you become more subliny. If you're far away from blood vessel, then you become more blind, right? So to test this hypothesis, uh, we did an experiment where we isolated cells uh, either as a sublining fibroblast here um, coded in red or lining fibroblast uh, here uh, shown in the blue circle. And we performed serial passage experiments where we took them, cultured them over two passages and performed RNA sequencing at each stage. We then, um, um, we then expressed this data onto the trajectory analysis and asked how does the tra transcript profile of these fibroblasts change over passages. So let me walk you through this. What we saw was that when you isolate these fibroblasts, either as lining or sublining, and perform RNA sequencing, they essentially map to the polar ends of the trajectory, right? That the lining fibroblast, when you take out tissue, before you culture them, looks like lining fibroblast, whereas sublining looks more like a sublining fibroblast. However, even just after one passage, which is quite about seven days in vitro culturing, they kind of merge, meaning that they move away from the polarized end towards this kind of the middle intermediate state. If you look at passage two, which is now two weeks in culture, essentially you cannot tell a lining and a sublining fibroblast because essentially all merge right into this intermediate category. And this is actually has important implication for the research right when that relies on culture fibroblasts because it tells us that when you culture fibroblasts over two passages, essentially they don't quite resemble their um, native counterpart in the tissue. So we, we then ask the question, can we recreate this, what we call positional identity, right? We knew that CD90 is a marker that track with fibroblasts near blood vessels. So we developed a system in which we can model formation of blood vessels within a synovial tissue organoid. So shown here is a, uh, one of the organoids which we call culture fibroblasts when they're video cells. And what you can see here is if you section through one of these uh, organoids is that these uh, uh, cells form a lining structure that resembles normal synovium. But in addition, if you go deeper in the sublining, now you see that there are these tubular structures, which when you examine on the confocal microscopy, you can see that these are formation of uh, um, uh, endothelial tubules. But what's more is that now we see fibroblasts that are surrounding the blood vessels shown here, suggesting that at least using this uh, system, we're able to recreate the sublining uh, structure seen in RA synovia. But are they actually sublining fibroblasts? Well, to answer the question, we, we went back into single cell RNA sequencing. Here, what we did was to take these organoids, either um, culture by itself, which means it's a fibroblast only organoid. We examined their trans transcriptomic profile by single cell RNA-seq. We then project them onto the profile of the native synovium. So here, what we show is the organoid cells are colored in orange, and the uh, native fibroblasts are colored in gray. So what you see here on the left is that when you culture fibroblasts by itself, even in an organoid situation, they map neither to the lining or sublining. They kind of stay in that intermediate state, right? They're not really differentiated. In contrast, if you now introduce endothelial cells to this organoid, not only do you recapitulate the endothelial cell part, but now look at the fibroblasts. They kind of move towards the perivascular or the sublining end of the spectrum, right? And to, to our surprise, we're also able to recreate neural cells, which again are these perivascular, you know, uh, uh, stromal cells, including pericytes and small cell cells. So this suggests to us that, you know, whatever molecular signal uh, that's driving the differentiation of these sublinic fibroblasts may be derived from these endothelial cells. But what is that signal? So to answer the question, we turn back into our single cell RS data. We perform a ligand receptor analysis where we ask which Ligand is expressed at a higher level in the endothelial cells, 
in which receptor, the cotton receptor, expressed highly on these perivascular subbonding fibroblasts. And this analysis is nominated the NOSH pathway, where the NOSH ligand, jagged 1, 2, and DLL4, are highly expressed on endothelium, and the cotton receptors, NOSH1 and NOSH3, are highly expressed on fibroblast. So we first then tested whether or not just activating the uh, NOSH pathway can actually induce uh, the fibroblast phenotype. So shown here on the right is an in vitro experiment in which we took different morphogen or growth factors that we think are important in fibroblast behavior and stimulated them over the course of three days and measured the gene expression of thi one the marker we used to track these fibroblasts. Um, and we can see that whereas TJ beta and the other growth factors really don't have a significant effect on thi one expression, activation of notch pathway with jacket one or TL4 significantly induces expression of thi one and this suggests to us that maybe notch pathway is actually an important pathway in the differentiated fibroblast. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if you take a step back and think about what the notch pathway is, this, this role is, right? It's really a classic development pathway by which cell types use to discern uh, their neighbors. So in the class example, um, a ligand presenting cell expressed in a notch ligand is able to signal to a receptor presenting cell through the cognate ligand receptor analysis. And through the binding of the ligand, the NOSH receptor is then cleaved, goes into the nucleus, and activates a whole set of transplant program, right, that allows the cell to differentiate um, from a cell that's not seeing a NOSH ligand. So this pathway became a very uh, uh, attractive candidate for uh, what's driving fibroblast differentiation. So we then turn back to our organoid system and ask, could we recapitulate this differentiation pathway and show that's NOSH dependent? So what we did is perform a multiplex single cell RNC experiment where fibroblasts were either uh, cultured by itself, shown in blue here, or in the present endothelial cells, or the third condition, which is fibroblasts with endothelial cells but in, the, in the presence of a notch inhibitor or DAPT. So what we found is that only when you co-culture fibroblasts with endothelial cells do you get this thigh one high fibroblast population shown here in this circle. And when you block notch pathway with this chemical inhibitor, then fibroblasts are no longer able to differentiate into the thi one high uh, population. Furthermore, we calculate a notch elevation score using an in vitro ligand-defined um, uh, RNA signalysis, which showed that indeed, in the thi one high uh, fibroblast population, there's a significant enrichment in the notch activation score suggesting that notch is necessary for the differentiation of this uh, phenotype, right? Um, we need to ask which notch receptor is actually mediating this pathway, because as, as I told you before, there are at least two notch receptors that came up on our screen, notch one and notch three. And of these two, notch three looks the most promising uh, because of this expression pattern. Here are two images I show, I'm showing you in RS Novia, where on the left, notch three protein is stained in purple, and what you can see here is that the expression notch three is really localized in this perivascular area where it's really strongest around the um, um, mural cells. But you can also detect expression notch three in the perivascular area by these fibroblasts, right? And we do think that the, probably the, the notch signal is stronger around the arterioles compared to the venous um, system because the, uh, the level of notch three expression is much stronger uh, around arterioles. We next stain uh, for the uh, NOSH3 uh, activation by looking specifically at the intracellular domain of NOSH3. And again, we can, we can see that the NOSH3 signal is really strongest around the perivascular fibroblast uh, compared to the rest of the uh, uh, synovia. We then ask whether or not NOSH3 is um, expression and activation is higher in RA compared to OA. Indeed, that's the case. Using flow cytometry on the left, we can see that uh, there's increased NOTCH3 uh, in RA fibroblasts compared to OA. In our single cell RNA seq data, we can also see that there's a high proportion of fibroblasts that are not activated uh, compared to OA. With that on, to went on to validate this NOTCH activation score using the AMP uh, data set that I showed earlier. And here, looking at the bulk RNA seq from about 40 or so our, uh, patients, we again show that uh, the fibroblasts from RA patient have a significant enrichment in the notch activation score.
right? So how do you, where do you go from here? You know, so uh, going back to this whole idea of, you know, finding new card discs, it would be nice if you could show this, you know, in a functional uh, way, showing that notch three is uh, important in arthritis. So we turn our attention to this model of uh, arthritis, uh, which uh, our colleague, uh, Chris Buckley, has nicely shown is fibroblast dependent. So we first ask, where is NASH3 expressed in the serum tracer model of arthritis? So on the left here uh, is a uh, UMAP projection of all the synovial cells uh, in a mouse um, arthritic joint. So you can see that, again, we can identify major fibroblast populations. We can also now see different myeloid cell populations that we know are important in this serum trans model arthritis. And what we found here is, is that the NASH3 expression at the MR level is quite restricted to the perivascular fibroblast, right? We don't see that in the uh, T cells and not really in the myeloid cells. So that suggests to us maybe NASH3 could be actually a reasonable target because of specificity and because of its uh, function in fibroblast and differentiation. So the first experiment we did is using a, um, uh, trans uh, a NACA mouse that lacks NOSH3. So these NOSH3 has been characterized uh, to be uh, uh, viable. Uh, they have normal joint histology. But what's interesting is that if we reduce arthritis using the same serum transplant arthritis, what we can see here is that these uh, NOSH3 NACA mouse are much, um, develop less severe form of arthritis compared to the wall-type control. And we can see this both in terms of measuring the clinical index measure the pulse thickness, as well as looking at the joint uh, histology, whereas you see this formation of the panis-like structure uh, in wild-type wild uh, wild uh, mice, the NOSH3 knockout mice are relatively protected from the panis formation, as well as the uh, um, bone erosion, right, seen in this, uh, seen in this, uh, in this model. Uh, furthermore, to really try to develop a therapeutic target, we collaborate with Genentech, who developed a NOSH3 inhibitory antibody. And you know, there's a whole set of uh, um, studies looking at NOSH in um, uh, cancer biology, where the idea is NOSH is important in driving um, cancer stem cell differentiation. So Genentech has developed these antibodies that can specifically target NOSH receptors. So we obtained this uh, antibody uh, that target the um, negative regulatory domain of NOSH3, NR3. What we found is that if we treat mice with this blocking the body um, in a prevention model, these mice develop much less severe form of arthritis compared to uh, mice treated with isotype control in the body. Again, we see this both in terms of the clinical uh, index as well as the, um, the paw uh, swelling. Furthermore, compared to the isotype control treated mice where there's evidence of bone erosion, as shown here and here, we reported that uh, treatment with anti-NOSH3 inhibitory antibody um, mitigate the bone erosion phenotype seen in this model arthritis. And to further show that we think that this mechanism is really driving, is, is being driven through fibroblasts, we perform sickle cell sequencing on the fibroblasts in these treated, um, uh, treated mice. Here, what I'm showing is that compared to healthy non-arthritic mice, in wild-time mice that has received this uh, thrombogenic serum, there's an increase in NOSH activation, but that increase in NOSH activation is abrogated both in the NOSH3 knockout mice as well as the uh, anti-NOSH3 inhibitory antibody treated mice, suggesting that the effects we see is on target uh, on the fibroblast. Um, and furthermore, you know, to try to nail down on the mechanism, we think that the actual mechanism is really about the differentiation in these fibroblasts. So this is a, a work that's still in progress where we, now we want to try to define how does NOSH3 inhibit the differentiation of these cells. So what we found here is that if you treat uh, fibroblasts with control, isotype control in the body, you see this expansion of the sublining or perivascular fibroblasts, just like we saw in RA. But if you treat them with anti-NR3, then there's a significant reduction in the expansion of the sublining or perivascular fibroblasts. Again, suggesting that the mechanism of action is really by directly targeting this uh, particular population. Okay, so I think uh, at this point, I just wanna summarize you know, what I told you so far. The first, you know, going back to the uh, initial goal of this project, right, is really to try to appreciate that fibroblasts um, are heterogeneous type of cells. Um, I hope that our uh, work, as well as work by others, have convinced you that fibroblasts are truly heterogeneous. 
And we think that one of the key um, aspects of strategic heterogeneity is driven by this position identity. And we think that through uh, multiple studies using different measurements of uh, fibroblast markers, we're able to show that there's a particular population of fibroblasts characterized by, by 1CD90 that's highly expanding RA and the core with inflammation. And the most recent work uh, is we're trying to find notch signaling as one of the key pathway in driving the differentiation of these pathogenic fibroblasts. So the model we'd like to suggest here, uh, based on our work, is that we think the initial, initial event here is through a um, uh, endothelium derived notch signaling that drives the ex um, expansion of neural cells, that expression notch three. And through this uh, feed forward mechanism where uh, jacket one can be upregulated upon C and notch signaling, this pathway could be perpetuated um, into the snow band and recruit more of these pathogenic fibroblasts. And thereby blocking NOSH3 at this critical node, we're able to abrogate the differentiation of these pathogenic fibroblasts. So in terms of thinking about the next step, you know, we're actively working on figuring out what additional signals are important for uh, establishing the, the positional identity of fibroblasts. I hope I've convinced you that at least one of the pathways that drives the expansion of these subline fibroblasts is through an thin drive notch. But we actually don't know yet what drives the differentiation of these lining fibroblasts, right? Or additional subset fibroblasts, which we call them intermediate. Perhaps there are additional other pathways, maybe the morphogen pathway that are unique to the environment around these fibroblasts that are necessary to maintain the differentiation. The second direction we think about is that the notch pathway um, in this case, we um, brought forward a role in rheumatoid arthritis. It would be very interesting to examine other inflammatory diseases, you know, including other inflammatory activities, to see whether the same pathway is relevant in expansion of the uh, uh, fibroblast, in, for example, in psoriatic arthritis, but perhaps in other autoimmune diseases, you know, such as interstitial lung disease or you know, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude by acknowledging the uh, people who contributed to the study. Uh, first is my mentor, Michael Brenner. He really kind of uh, um, um, paved the way for uh, at least using the high dimensional analysis fibroblast. And it's really his vision, you know, that drove many of these projects forward. And also Shoma Ray Chowdhury, who was my co-mentor, who uh, led the biomedical analysis uh, behind both the AMP um, uh, papers, as well as the story we recently reported in Notch. Uh, finally, these are my uh, colleagues, Ila Kwasanski, who was a, a postdoc in uh, Shomo's lab who did the Bauchman analysis for the, for the notch paper, as well as Jenny Marshall from Chris Buckley's lab and the talented technicians in Michael's lab. Um, and these are my funding sources. Um, and I just also thank you for attention. Um, and I'll stay in on this you know, picture I always uh, want to, um, to, to bring up because being a smile to my face. When I look at the fibroblast differential trajectory through these kind of abstract art, that almost, almost always reminds me of a real life trajectory. And this is a picture of my son, Kent, who you know, went from this kind of a, a single cellular um, thing into this you know, um, robust, robust little two-year-old. You know? So in some ways, I see similarity between um, the signs I'm doing, but also the real life trajectory of, a, um, uh, of my son. So uh, here's my contact information, uh, and I'll be uh, happy to um, take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. That was terrific. Let me just start off while people are sending you questions. Um, so firstly, is the leukocyte rich and the leukocyte um, deficit, the, the low leukocyte populations, are they related to the duration of disease or not? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so I think that uh, short is that uh, we kind of answer that with a phase one because we limit the number of patients. And so, you know, the, um, the covariance right here is, you know, both in terms of situation, but also with their uh, disease activity. I would say that most of these local poor RA samples came from uh, arthroplasty samples. So these are RA patients who have long standing disease, mostly are well treated, who undergo arthroplasty for joint replacement, right? So in that case, we think that, you know, the local poor state may reflect the long situation, as you suggested, or may reflect the fact that these are actually patient inhibition, right? So I think to answer that question you know, uh, correctly, 
in the phase two of the data where you know uh, we now have the ability to assess up to 80 or so patients we can now make those see whether or not the local core represents a you know phase of the disease or a very specific subtype type of RA. Okay, and uh, just one more question. So you've looked at the relationship between the fibroblasts and the vasculature kind of in a steady state. Uh, you know, certainly in RA, one wouldn't expect the endothelium to be all happy and quiet. Have you perturbed the endothelium in any way, the vasculature, to see what happens then to the fibroblast? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so that's an ongoing work uh, yeah. in our lab, trying to go upstream to think about what is meeting that phenotype. I will say that based on our, at least our hypothesis, it's really the vascular change about the surprise to my skin. In a paper that we reported, we think that the signal is actually coming from the arterial endothelium. So one hypothesis here is perhaps this, this you know, um, arterialization of the vasculature that's driving the downstream effects on fibroblasts. Uh, so there are, you know, mouse system that, you know, tr transgenic system that may allow us to address that experimentally. Okay, great. So. Um, can you see the Q and A? And yeah, yes, I have that in front of me. Uh, so yeah. I'll go through them. So I have a question from uh, Grant Hughes. Uh, and the question is: Inflammatory fibroblasts, is the inference signature type one or type two? Um, so this refers to the phase one data, which I'll just uh, go through really quick. So I would say that for the gene set analysis here, um, because there are so much uh, shared uh, in terms of the downstream target of type one, type two that gene set reduction didn't really specifically nominate uh, gamma versus you know, um, uh, uh, type 1 signature. We do think based on some of the specific genes, uh, such as uh, uh, 6CL9 uh, shown here, that this is most likely more uh, um, gamma signature. And kind of makes sense if you think about because the local rich population that we're analyzing here are mostly you know, chock full of uh, uh, T cells, right? So it kind of you know, fits with the hypothesis that perhaps is a T cell that's secreting gamma that's driving this type um, uh, gamma response in fibroblast. But we haven't really shown that you know, experimentally yet. Okay. Um, and do, do let me know, please, uh, do let me know if that answered your question or you know, did not answer your question. Okay, the second question from uh, Michael Richter is, did the anti-NRR antibody prevent arthritis or treat it? Any other reason to think this target would be useful in patients who already have joint inflammation? Yes, this is a great question. I get at this a lot, you know. So in the paper we reported, you know, we use it as a prevention model, which means that we started the treatment of antibody as we induce arthritis. So it's really more of a prevention model. Um, we're now doing experiments underway, which is to test once you allow arthritis to establish, can you still treat it with the um, not treating antibody and abrogate arthritis? Um, so we're actually working on that. Okay, another question from Grant Hughes. Uh, how do fibroblast populations differ in active inflammatory synovitis versus synovial hypertrophy, uh, quote unquote, uh, inflammation treated? Yeah, so this kind of gets back to Keith's question earlier, right? That, you know, the heterogeneity we saw in fibroblast signature, we think we reflects the uh, um, inflammatory state of synovium, right? This particular signature we saw that we think is inflammatory fibroblasts correlate with local rich but also uh, active disease uh, state. And that is to say that they track with, you know, CDI and other histological measurements information. So my personal opinion on this is it probably does track more of the information. The sort of hypertrophy is an interesting question, which I think you're maybe suggesting that, you know, there is a potentially a pathotype of RA that's more characterized by hypertrophy and not so much inflammation. Um, and I think the answer will have to, 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 to go to the AMP phase two, where now we have enough of the clinical uh, 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 variation, but also histological variation to try to answer that question. So Kevin, there are a couple of um, questions on the chat. I don't, can you see those or not? Yes, I can see that as well. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so there's one question from um, Mark, uh, which is what is the plasticity and reversi reversibility of fibroblast genotypes? Uh, that's a great question. I, I do want to just uh, show you one slide here. Um, and I think this question about the plasticity is really the uh, central to the whole biology of fibroblasts, right? Because I think what this experiment showed me is that if you take fibroblasts, right, from synovium and you sort them out, even just over two passages, they kind of converge, right, or de differentiate into this state that's neither subannual lining. And 
essentially this experiment showed us that these are really plastic cells, right? That without their native environment, uh, they can really maintain this differential state. So I think that both are true, that these are plastic cells, and also the reverse, reversibility is also true, right? Because um, at least with this particular pathway, we think that by adding nucleo cells, you can push them towards uh, one phenotype more than the other. So I think that at least our uh, evidence supports the idea that fibroblasts do exhibit quite a, amount, quite a bit of plasticity and reversibility. Okay, um, another question uh, from Barbara Zhang is that cancer-associated fibroblasts are being more and more implicated in, in carcin uh, cancer genesis. Uh, could you envision using your data to target? Uh, I love that question because I think my opinion um, is answer is yes. Um, I do think there are quite a lot of, um, quite a bit of parallel between what we think are inflammatory fibroblasts and cancer-associated fibroblasts. And in, in that literature, there's also emerging data on this kind of heterogeneity within cancer-associated fibroblasts. Um, and through a, you know, internal kind of a, a collaboration with a lab at the Bro, we now begun to look at, in particular, the notch pathway in cancer-associated fibroblasts. So I, I think that the answer to the question is to be determined. Um, but I'm very excited to see whether the same pathway uh, can be uh, targeted uh, in cancer. Okay, um, I have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Lyle. Do you think that the perivascular fibroblasts are functionally pericytes? Are they pH alpha beta positive? Uh, so I think that's a great question. You know, so I think that um, essentially uh, part of our motivation to actually look at uh, fibroblasts, right, in a very unbiased global view is because I'm, I was very curious to compare the pericytes or mirror cells to our fibroblasts, right? Because I think they're so related. And I think the answer is yes. The subline fibroblasts are indeed pH beta high. And when you apply the drug analysis, um, these cells are much more similar to the parasite that's then the lining fibroblast. And there's actually literature in the development biology will suggest that the origin of parasites is actually come from this kind of a mesenchyme, um, mesenchymal fibroblast that are pH of beta positive. So, you know, when we first got into this question, we kind of look at the literature. And to be honest, I think I was inspired by the literature to kind of formulate a hypothesis that perhaps there's a connection between parasites and this inflammatory fibroblast. Okay. Um, okay. One more question uh, from uh, Mark. Will the antifibrotic agents used in interstitial lung disease, yeah, uh, e.g., uh, Nintendo, have a role in RA? I think that's an interesting question. You know, I think that um, the idea here is comparing, you know, two different sites, right? Obviously, you know, let's say RAILD and with Snowbeam uh, in RA, with the same pathway uh, is. Um, is being uh, co-opted. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that antifibrotic will work in the synovium. Uh, I, I don't know enough about whether people look at it. But I do think, maybe think about the other way. It makes sense, right? That if we see an inflammatory population synovium, right, fibroblast synovium, could you see the same population in, let's say, RILD, right? If you do, then potentially a way to think about a fibroblast target therapy is to target both organ, right, in patients who have, you know, long manifestation of RA, right, maybe those patients would be the candidate for a fibroblast target therapy. Um, but this is really speaking without any, any data, uh, but some, uh, it's a research direction that we're interested in going to as well. Kevin, there's a question there from our department chair, uh, Dr. Young, about cancer-associated fibroblasts. Can you see that one? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I, I spoke to you a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to reiterate. I think that, you know, uh, my, my thought is, is yes, I think that there are a remarkable similarity between the cancer associated fibroblasts and these tissue resonant fibroblasts. You know, I think that one approach one could take is to take the data that's emerged from both fields, right? The single cell profiling of cancer that will include the fibroblasts and, for example, data from AMP, right? And do integration, right? To see how much similarity do we see. Um, I was mentioned earlier that in particular, I think the notch pathway is worth considering because essentially the biology that we're describing here is a vascular phenotype, right? And we know from decades of cancer research that, you know, angiogenesis is such a crucial part of the whole female biology. So it would not surprise me if the same notch pathway is being co-opted uh, in the, the, during the differentiated, 
differentiation of cancer social fibroblasts. Uh, but that's very really exciting to be, uh, that needs to be investigated. Okay, well, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, I think we better leave it there because I know you've got a whole set of meetings. Uh, Laurie, anything you want to add here? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Wei, for joining us. Um, we will post the recording of this lecture on our website shortly. Great. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.